ABC Knowledge. In June 1960, John Freeman's face-to-face -face interview was with the novelist and satirist Evelyn Waugh. It was Waugh's television debut and he was in an anxious frame of mind. He seems to be making a studied attempt to appear bored and, in legendary war style, was obstructive, irritable and curt and even corrected Freeman whenever he could. In short, Waugh gave Freeman a rough ride as an interviewer. A few weeks ago, John Freeman recalled the occasion. The Evelyn Waugh interview, uh, dare I say it, uh, seems to me to be an important one, uh, really because this man, in my judgment, is one of the unquestionably great writers of this century. And I attached enormous importance uh, to trying to make some sort of relation, if I could, uh, between his work and war as a human being. Um, he was very difficult, he was very uptight. Um, I think he disliked me, and whether he did or not, he was extremely nervous. I remember greeting him before, when I met him before the interview, and I said, good evening, Mr. War, or words to that effect. And he replied, the name, sir, is War, not Woff. And since I had addressed him as Mr. War to begin with, this was clearly a, 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 a rehearsed uh, antagonistic attitude that he was going to take to the interviewer. Um, I'm sorry that, that um, he chose to be like that, and I'm disappointed that I didn't succeed in getting more out of him, because of all the people on the list of face-to-faces, he is the one whom I think I hold in most honour. Evelyn Waugh was most certainly antagonistic towards John Freeman, and he must surely have had in mind an episode from his novel, The Ordeal of Gilbert Pinfold. In it, Pinfold is interviewed by a man from the BBC called Angel, and detects in his questions an underlying malice, even an intrusion on his privacy. Pinfold, writes War, answers succinctly and shrewdly, disconcerting his adversaries, if adversaries they were. But the episode plays on Pinfold's mind and becomes part of his breakdown. War had had a nervous breakdown himself in 1954, and some say a searching interview with BBC Radio had contributed to it. War admits to Freeman that Pinfold was autobiographical. Perhaps War had already rehearsed his face-to-face -face interview in his imagination and wouldn't allow himself the possibility of a pleasant experience in reality. Who knows? But whatever War's state of mind at the time of the interview, his brittle, sometimes cynical humour that was such a trademark of his writing is never far from the surface. And it's simply a delight just to observe the novelist who wrote such memorable books as, among others, Decline and Fall, A Handful of Dust, and Brideshead Revisited. Well, I'd like to start at the very beginning of your life. Where were you born? I have no memory of the event. I'm told it occurred at 11 Hillfield Road, West Hampstead. I believe it's all been demolished now, like most places. Uh, do you have any memories of that home at all? How, how old were you when you left it? Uh, infancy. So that you don't remember that at all? Not at all. Uh, your father was a publisher, was he not? He was a publisher and a writer, literary critic, minor poet. He liked books and he liked writing. Man of letters, I think, would be the word from William. Uh, was he reasonably prosperous? I mean, how big was the house, for instance? Oh, well, those days, tiny. Bigger than most people live in now. Uh, did you have a, a, a staff of servants looking after you? Well, I had a nanny, of course, yes. Uh, yes, but I don't mean you personally, but oh, the family. Cook and a, a cook and a housemaid yes. and so on, yes. 
Gardner. Uh, your you one elder brother. That's so. Do you remember him at that time? My memory is awfully bad. Um, I was, of course, aware of his existence. He was five years older than me and always very much more advanced. And when time I was at prep school, he was at public school. By the time I was at public school, he was in the army and so on. So I really didn't know him at all well until oh, after the First War. Uh, if your memory is bad, it's quite interesting to ask you if you've got any vivid pictorial memory of those days at that house at North End. Uh, well, I've had certain pictorial memories because a lot of the furniture is now in my own house, so that I'm constantly reminded of it. And it's awfully hard to know what one remembers oneself or one's been told to remember. I'm told that at the age of four, I was taken to Hampstead Heath Fair by my father and greatly indulged in all the little coconut shies and things, and that when told I must get back for lunch, and I rolled on the ground and shouted, you boot, you beast, you hideous ass. I was never allowed to forget that as a child, but I've got no personal memory of it. Uh, do your mother and father stand equal in your memory now, or is your father clearer? Um, equal, I think. Uh, were you rather strictly brought up in the Edwardian manner? No. No, I had an absolutely lyrically happy childhood. I think that's why I have so few memories of it. Um, until I went to prep school, I was taught by my mother. And very well taught, I think, in the orders and rudiments. My father was usually out of the house most of the day. And I remember him largely as um, appearing at bedtime, you know. Your parents, of course, were not Catholics. Oh, no. Did your mother give you religious instruction? Yes. Uh, of the simple uh, Anglican yes. broad church view of the world? They were both pious church-going Anglicans. Did you accept that at, uh, when you first remember? Oh, yes, other. And continuously have you uh, taken a religious view of the world? Certainly up to the age of about 16. When you were a small child, do you remember dreaming at all? No. I know I do dream every night of my life, all the time. But dream disappears the moment I wake up. How old were you when you could first read and write? I couldn't write fluently until I was seven. And it was sometime about then that you did write a story, didn't you, or a book even? I've always found spelling very hard, I do now. But um, the spelling's very bad. His narrative, I was keeping with 87. Did you tell stories or even enjoy listening to stories very much when you were extremely small? By extremely small, you mean younger than seven? Yes, I do. Oh, yes, certainly. Um, I don't think telling so much, but being read to a great deal. How old were you when you first wrote a story? I think seven, seven and a half. Just for the delectation of your family? But I don't know what the motive was. It was um, called the curse of the horse race. And it was a um, warning against the dangers of betting. And it was one of the temptations which my father never at all subject. He was um, in his race course in his life. I had a Calvinist nanny, and I think I, perhaps she'd told me something about the danger of horse racing. But it's plain from the story, I didn't know anything at all about the technique of the term. Had you any consciousness of, of missing having a sister at that age? I wasn't well missing anything. My life was idyllically happy. That's perhaps a very slightly trap question because I have noticed in one or two of your of your books, particularly in Put Out More Flags, that there's a very curious brother-sister relation. And I, I wonder whether this is a, a, a problem which has exercised you a lot. No, you must allow the novelist's imagination to roam more freely than that, you know. Well, I do. Then to school. Where was your first school? First school was a day school in Hampstead where I used to go, um, it was a school of half boarders and half day boys. I was a day boy most of the time. On rare occasions when my parents went abroad, I used to go and board there. And most of your family went to Sherborne? My father went there, my elder brother, and he sent his sons there. Uh, it's a very curious thing. My father was absolutely miserable at Sherborne and had no memory of it except of terror and cruelty. And he never went back to the school. When he came to sending my brother to school, the first thing he did was put him down to Sherman. Well, why didn't he put you down? He did put me down, indeed. But um, then my brother, at the age of 17, wrote a book called The Loom of Youth, based on his school days. And so I was blackballed, and they had hasted to find some alternative for me. Which was Lansing? Yes, I'm very fortunate. You, you, I was going to ask, no, you don't have any feeling of resentment about that? No. Um, Sherman is clearly a more beautiful little old town to grab in. 
thing again about dancing, certainly in my day, was its complete isolation. I might have been living on an island of miles many anywhere. I never saw any other human life except the life of the school. You have said that you were not particularly happy there. Have I? Whom to? Well, this is, you've said it and been reported in public and you've never denied it, so I take it that you've said it. Well, I wouldn't like you to think that I was um, bullied or miserable or anything. The thing is, I went there in 1917, and of course all schools would be in 1917. One was always hungry, always cold, chill brains, the core taking up a little at one's time. But then it was rather nice because suddenly life got better and better. Suddenly sweets began to appear and cakes and all the good masters had been at the war, of course. One had been taught by very rather dreary old dugouts. And then the good young masters came back. So one had a sensation of a gradually opening, brightening scene. Did you form any friendships at Lansing which have lasted you right through to the present day? Acquaintances. But not intimate friends. No, and I see regularly no. nowadays, no. no. Were you a conformist at school? But he had to take jolly good care he didn't play the fool in school or in chapel or in the ball field or anywhere else. Uh, talking about chapel, uh, apart from the physical appearance of Lansing Chapel, was the Anglican influence extremely strong in those days? Yes. And did you at that time have any doubts about your religious faith? You think it absurd? My doubts began through reading Pope's essay on man at the age of about 16. And uh, Although, what, as you know, he was a Catholic. Uh, what, what form did they take? Which was the first time I began to speculate at all, metaphysically. Through the notes on Pope's essay on man, I was turned on to Leibniz and so on. Through that general 18th century enlightenment. And um, not in any way sophisticated way, but I began then to question. Uh, why did you choose to go to Harford College at Oxford? They paid me. You had an open scholarship? Yes. In history? Yes. Did you subsequently remain a, a, a keen historian? No. <laughs> you didn't get, in fact, a very distinguished degree. That's why I asked the question. I got a bad third, yes. Why did this happen? Sloth. What did you do at Oxford? Enjoyed myself. How? Grew up, grew up you know. Yes, how? Well, as one did in those days. Um, well, people have forgotten. You tell me. Getting tight a lot of the time. Entertaining, making new friends. Writing a series of articles, undergraduate magazines, all that kind of thing. Um, it's said of you, and indeed one would perhaps deduce from your books, that you moved very much in what was then called the aesthetic set at Oxford, which is very different, I think, from your present life. Is that true? Uh, both those statements are true, yes. Yes. Um, did you, uh, have you been conscious of any revulsion against that particular set of people at any stage, or has this been a gradual development? Oh, no, it? I'm still a pure aesthete. But uh, in middle life, one doesn't have to dress up in special clothes in order to enjoy architecture, you know. <laughs> when you... Um, it's said of you, and indeed one would perhaps deduce from your books, that you moved very much in what was then called the aesthetic set at, at Oxford, which is very different, I think, from your present life. Is that true? Uh, both those statements are true, yes. Yes. Um, Did you, uh, have you been conscious of any revulsion against that particular set of people at any stage, or has this been a gradual development? Oh, no, I'm still a pure aesthete. But uh, in middle life, one doesn't have to dress up in special clothes in order to enjoy architecture, you know. <laughs> when you were an undergraduate, did you have enough money? Well, I was deeply in debt, of course. You always were. But you were not resentful or conscious of not having enough money. Your father gave you what you basically needed. He gave me more than I basically needed, and I spent about twice as much. When you came down from Oxford, did you have to earn a living at once? Not at once. It was gradually borne in on me. Um, I became... Um, I always wanted to be a painter. And I went to an art school for a time. And, well, but then your father was paying for you? Oh, yes. And then, of course, the bills were beginning to come in. And eventually there was a kind of debt settlement in which I revealed the state of my indebtedness. It doesn't seem very much now, but it's quite a lot then. Or five hundred pounds, eh? and um, so he paid him on condition I earned my living. And I went to the prep school master, which was the sort of resort for the criminal classes of those days. And out of which, presumably, decline and fall eventually. Well, uh, very remotely. Emerged, yes. 
Did you get, uh, uh, was decline and fall a financial success? Still is. Yes, but was it at that time? Oh, not in the sense that um, I was immediately rich. It was um, bought in some money. Uh, I mean, the point is, how old were you when you were first conscious that you could earn a decent living by writing? I should think 25. Now, how old were you when you were converted to the Catholic faith? I think 30. Had you studied for a long time well, rising, before you. your conversion? I was under instruction, literally under instruction, for about um, three months. But of course, I'd interested myself in it before reading books independently. And so I I'm quite interested to ask you, because it isn't clear from the book, whether you were almost a Catholic at the time you were writing Vile Bodies. Not at all. No, no, no. Um, I was as near an atheist as one could be, I think, at that time. Is there, uh, I hope not an impertinent question, is there any connection in your own mind between Father Rothschild in that book and Father Darcy, who afterwards oh, received... Oh, no, 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 no. Um, no, it's pure literary convention. I mean, the sly Jesuit has been going on in English novels for 200 years. Uh, nevertheless, what is a little un unexpected, perhaps, in Vile Bodies is what appears to be your, your obvious sympathy with the sly Jesuit. I'm surprised you find that. I hadn't done it such a bit at the time. <laughs> uh, did you have a sudden revelation which led you to, to, to this conversion, or was it a very gradual process? Well, I think I'd always, I say always, from the age of 16 or so, realized that Catholicism was Christianity, that all other forms of Christianity were only good so far as they chipped little bits off the main block. It is a conversion to Christianity rather than a conversion to Catholicism as such. Well, this is the point I wanted to bring out. Uh, this came uh, after a period when you had lost your faith and you regained it in the Catholic Church. It wasn't, you hadn't been continuously a devout and practicing Christian who oh, moved no. over to Rome. No, 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 no. I think from the age of 16 to the age of 28, I didn't go to church at all. I remember. Uh, since you were received into the Catholic Church, have you ever seriously doubted? No. Never been through a period when no. things have been difficult for you. Looking back now... Well, it's very difficult. I'm exasperation at the extraordinary behaviour of individual clergymen. Ah, yes, but no, you've never, never doubted the central clergy. canon of your faith, no, no. no. Looking back now, uh, what would you say is the greatest gift in terms of tranquility or peace of mind or whatever that, that your faith has given you? But it isn't a the lucky dip that you get something out of, you know, it's um, simply admitting the existence of God, your dependence on God, your contact with God, the fact that everything in the world that's good depends on him. It isn't um, a sort of added amenity of a welfare state that you say, well, to all this, having made a good income, now I have this little icing on top of religion. It's the essence of the whole thing. You say all that is good in the world comes from God. You don't seem to find very much which is good in the modern world. You've seen it as consistently as a decadent world, have you not? But there's good in a decadent world. Yes, but your purpose in life is, what, to castigate or to chronicle the decadent world? Do, do, do you see a purpose in your books? Are you trying to scourge us into reform? Oh, no, 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 no. No, I'm just trying to write books. Yes, but nonetheless, no one who is as uh, intellectually coherent as you are can write books, even just as finished, polished objects, without having a certain purpose in mind, I suspect. Quite unconscious. Um, what is your favourite book? One called Helena. No, I've never read awfully good. Well, wh why, tell me why you like that best. Well, it's as much the best, you know. Um, it's the best written, most interesting theme. What particular, in particular, fascinated you about Helena? She's an unusual saint. Yes, that's one of the fascinating things. She, practically nothing's known about her. Um, Catholicism in your books does seem very much to be equated with the aristocratic life and so on. She happened to be the empress. It wasn't the fact of her rank that made her interesting. It was the fact of finding the true cross made her interesting. Uh, is, so, is humility... If I might continue, please. the fact of the true cross was that there was an actual piece of wood, a historical fact, behind the gospel. Whether or not the wood she found was the cross, open to doubt. But at that time, all those Asiatic cults that 
Gnostics and people were trying to theorize and symbolize and find away the simple facts of an actual crucifixion on a piece of wood. And she I represented as being a simple English girl thrown greatly to her disgust into the imperial life, not the least enjoying the high position, and putting her finger at once on what was wrong with imperial Rome at that time, which is they were losing the sense of actuality. That, you might indeed say, was a didactic book. Yes. I was going to put this to you, because yes. what you've just been saying yes. is highly didactic. Could I ask you some questions now about Pinfold? The, the, the question mm. that everybody broadly wants to ask you is, is how far Pinfold is an account of your own brief illness. Almost exact. In fact, um, had we cut down a lot, it would be infinitely tedious to have recorded everything. It's the account of three weeks hallucinations going on absolutely continuously. Uh, and you heard voices? I heard all these voices. If I had written down everything the voices said, it would be immensely boring. One had to be selective. But did they say the same thing to you that they said to Pinfold? Oh, yes, rather. Again and again and again, day and night. And there were three different kinds of voices, really, who talked to Pinfold. There was the beautiful girl who made appointments with him. They gradually thinned down, if you remember the book. Um, at first, I conceived that everyone was involved. I was, I was rationalizing it all the time. It was of the least like losing one's reason. It was simply one's reason working hard, but on the wrong premises. Yes. But I wonder why the voices said what they did. I mean, have you any notion well, why, I've always you should, wondered that. why you should conjure up this lovely girl who made appointments No, yes, I've always wondered that. And you never kept the appointment? Uh, half did. Yes. Do you remember the story? Um, went out to look for her and she wasn't there. And then the other, the most odious voices, said that Pinfold was a... A, a, a homosexual, a communist Jew, a parvenu, and so on. Were these the, hal the kind of hallucinations that you yourself felt? Oh, yes, these were the, those voices. Exactly. And in your own life, was it the neighbors who were making these remarks? Because, again, if you remember in Pinfold, his neighbors were involved in this persecution. I have no idea what my neighbors said about me. <laughs> but did you feel that your neighbors no. were involved? No. The whole thing was... Um, so puzzling, I had to, if you remember, invent the theory of the Broadcasting Society. Your, well, your own people were involved. Well, I was going to ask you, have you, in fact, a particular deep feeling about the BBC? No. Because it comes again into a number of your books, which is why I ask, always in a slightly pejorative context. Well, everyone thinks a lot of the BBC, but I don't think I'm more violent than anybody else. Um, in the life that you've chosen to lead now, you, you, you lead the life of a country gentleman, or almost a squirearchic life. Do you get on happily with your neighbours? Well, it's not really accurate to say I lead a squirearchic life. I mean, a squirearchic life means sitting on the bench of magistrates and going round cattle shows, that kind of thing. I lead life of absolute solitude. You don't, in fact, take part in the activities of, of, of your... No. I live in the country because I like to be alone. Well, now, you have made a very noticeable rejection of life because this is not true at one time you lived in the town you mixed in society you wrote books about society and now you've withdrawn completely were you conscious of a sudden decision to do that it happened about eight years ago not suddenly but i suddenly got bored with them um, but suddenly i gradually got bored with society largely i think through deafness and i can hear you perfectly and i can hear one person perfectly but um but there's a crowd I get dazed. But I think it's probably psychosomatic, but I don't hear because I'm bored, not I'm bored because I can't hear. Do you ever reflect on the, the difference between the sort of life you've chosen now and your own family background? Very little difference. Well, is there not? Do, do, you, do you have people to stay with you constantly? Do you still mix in the literary world? I'm not as hospitable as my father was. He was always having people to stay. And do you miss that or not? No. One wonders, it's, uh, this may sound rude, but it genuinely arises out of the things you've said and the things you've written. One wonders whether this is, in some curious way, a kind of charade that you've decided to assume the, the attitude uh, of country life, which in, in your books doesn't seem as if it's entirely natural to you. It's quite true. I haven't the smallest interest in country life, um, in the agricultural sense or the local government sense. Country to me is a place where I can be silent. 
Are you very sensitive to the criticisms of others and kind reviews of your books? I don't think so. I've often wondered, for instance, at the time in the middle of the 30s when you were assailed by, well, by Rose Macaulay and one or two others for being a fascist because you reported the Abyssinian War from the Italian side, did, did that upset you or prey on your mind at all? I wasn't even aware she assailed me. Well, then that's a very effective answer. Have you ever brooded on what appears to you to be unjust or adverse criticism? No, I'm afraid if someone praises me, I think what an ass, and if they abuse me, I think what an ass. And if they say nothing about you at all and take no notice of you? That's the best I can hope for. You like that when it happens to you? Yes. Why are you appearing in this program? Poverty. We've both been hired to talk in this deliriously happy way. Now, you constantly tell people that you're poor, and I don't want to ask you impertinent questions, but you're a great deal luckier than many people because you made something of a fortune before the war, before it was all taxed Not away. Not a penny. Never saved a penny. You and never of saved course, it. no honest man has been able to save any money in the last 20 years. Um, looking at yourself, because I'm sure you are a self-critical person, what do you feel is your worst fault? Irritability. Are you a snob at all? I don't think. Um, irritability with your family, with strangers? Absolutely everything. Uh, inanimate objects and people, animals, anything. Yes. Have you, um, do you remember, if I may put a, a, a Catholic question to you out of the, out of the uh, Penny Catechism, do you remember the Twelve Fruits of the Holy Ghost? I should do, I don't. Well, they include charity, joy, patience, benignity, mildness. Yes. Do you, do you fall short in these? Yes. Are you ever rude to people, uh, nuns and priests, and people in your own faith, or is this a thing you reserve rather for outsiders? Well, it's never rude to a nun, obviously. Um, I don't think I've been rude to a priest, no. But that's a more respect for authority. Not it's, to not a, it's not a feeling of, of, of oneness. It's not being on the inside with him. Do you feel the need to belong to an organization all the time? Best I can tell you in that way is that I'm much more at ease with fellow Catholics than I am with heathens or Protestants. Um, one has so many basic assumptions in common that there's so much doesn't need saying. And when you're talking to even the most amusing and intelligent heathen, you suddenly find that something you've said has no meaning at all to them. How high in your scale of virtues do you put the Christian duty of service to others? It isn't for me to make these scales. Um, my service is simply to bring up one family. Uh, one would think from reading, for instance, The End of Brideshead, uh, that, that you'd attach a tremendous importance to the abnegation of self and the performing of menial tasks even. Now, is that an illusion? Do you not attach much importance to this aspect of Christian virtue? Well, of course, enormous importance, but uh, for the people with the ascetic temperament, we aren't all called to the ascetics. I, I'd like now to ask you a, a last question, and I want to go back to Pinfold. Looking back on that mental breakdown that you had then, and on your life as you see it, can you see that there's any permanent or conflict or instability perhaps between the way of life in which you were brought up and the way of life in which you're chosen to live, you've chosen to live now. Oh, I know what you're getting at. I'd ask Priestley said that in an article. I think I dealt with it in The Spectator. That's what I was thinking of. He wrote it in The New States when I answered The Spectator. Well, I was not I thinking, thinking of this, but I was asking you whether you ever had any fear no, no, that this sort of thing may happen to you again. That's Priestley thought that. From Wild Childs to the drug overdose that killed her. Reputations on Janis Joplin, next on BBC Knowledge.